Here we go. Right. Welcome, Father Kevin Bates. Father Kevin Bates is the parish priest of um, Villa Maria at Hunters Hill. Holy name of Mary. Holy n- name of Mary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So thank you. Um, <laughs> Villa Maria is the nickname of the church. Oh, the right. Parish is holy name of Mary. Yeah. Oh, I've learned something. Mm-hmm. Who is God? Who knows? Um, Thomas Aquinas said, with our own intelligence only, we can say what God is like and what God is not, that God is more than. That's it. In terms of our faith, then, we've learned to know that God is love, and, uh, and then that then we spend our lifetime unpacking that. You know? God's the ultimate mystery, mm. if there is a God. If there is a God. Yes. Um, in your well, life... Well, that's what faith always uh, calls us to that belief in God. And then there's always that darkness of faith that says, oh, do I believe? You know? This is a good question. Mm. So there's no easy answer. Mm. Um, where have you found mo- God most in your own life? Oh, goodness. I don't know how to answer that on the spot like this, but uh, you know, just everywhere. Um, in today's funeral, um, it was an exquisite funeral of an old friend. And he was the most gentle, good man. And his spirit was there right through it. His wife was amazing the way she spoke, and it was just, it was just great. So, so uh, that was one instance in the smile of a baby and holding the hand of someone who's dying. Um, in nature, I mean, it, God, to me, God is everything's a sacrament of God. So he ain't hard to find, really. Mm. Uh, he's all around. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't, I don't have to find God. He's there mm. if you're listening with the eyes of faith. And mm. open to the questions of, around God. Yeah. Well, obviously, you've just used the word sacrament. What do you mean by that? Well, the sacraments. Well, it's a bit like a lens to your camera. Here. It lets the light through. Um, but there's a filter, so that's why we need faith. It's like our focus. Yeah. You know, the, the filter. The filter uh, makes well, there's the, the darkness of faith again. Um, St. Paul talked about that. Uh, we only see through a glass darkly. Mm. While we're here. So, so uh, for the sacrament, it's really a bit of a window to the sacredness of things. And if we are attentive, then we uh, we we, uh, we glimpse God. We come into focus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, has there been a moment in your life where God has come clearer? Yeah. Or God has drawn closer. So, in terms of your focus, you're talking about. Oh yeah, lots. Moments of intimacy, moments of uh, grief, uh, moments of prayer, moments of deep joy, and also deep suffering. Mm. They, they all can provide, they all can be like a turning of the lens for you. Yeah. That's good. Oh, sorry. That's all right. My sister. Excuse me. Press the pause button on this one, too. There you go. That's on silent now. Um, has God acted in your life? Uh, yeah, I reckon. Um, I think God acts in everyone's life if we're listening. And um, it's a matter of, you know, for some people, God acting in their life can be, you know, they can see it everywhere to the point of superstition, Mm -hmm. you know. But there are many things that happen in one's life, and it's happened in my life, where I I, I have a deep sense that God was part of that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a deep knowing, and it's not a, it's a sub-rational knowing. Uh, Richard Raw, the great uh, Franciscan writer, talks about that in one of his books. It's just a mystical knowing is a different way of knowing. Mm. You know, and, and it's it, you can't you can't um, you can't um, you can't co- contain that within uh, formulae. You, know? mm. you can talk about it in metaphor. Yeah? Yeah. Mm. It's hard to yeah, yeah, yeah really yeah, label sure, it. Sure. Um, what about joy? Where would joy, like, where have you found joy? Obviously, Mary's magnificent, and throughout the Gospels, for Maris, there's this dimension of joy. 
What about where is joy oh, in God. your life? Where isn't it? Like if you, I mean, the, the life is full of tragedy and suffering. We've mm. had a lot of it in the parish and in our neighbourhood lately. Um, where is joy? Oh, golly. I don't know. I can't. Well, you haven't got my film in that thing. <laughs> um, joy, joy is, um, again, the smile of a child, the moment of... Um, Seeing people grow in faith, mm. you know, as a priest, mm. but to me that's really a lovely thing. The joy at our parish dinner and just our parish parishioners, 190 of them getting together and really just savouring the time together, mm. you know? Everyone talked about it for a whole week or more. And it wasn't, it was having fun, but it was something more, you know? A it's about there. people. Yeah. Um, oh, our parish council went away on for a treat day. We went away together a couple of weeks ago and, and I led the, the, the little sessions but our being together was a joy and our council for instance our council meetings where we always share on a, around a spiritual mm. reading first mm. you know before we start any other practical stuff and just the depth of faith of these people I'm just just humbled you know mm. and, and that's a joy wow. um, I don't know it just goes on and on yeah. you know Something mm. someone said to me after the funeral this morning was a moment of joy, you know? Mm. So, so, yeah, you, you, if you, if, yeah, like I, my life is full of joy. Mm. Yeah. Would you say that's tasting God when, when you... Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. It's one of Father Collins' lovely phrases, and I think, I think that's right. It's, it's a, yeah, I've, got a, I've always got a sense of, 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 of when I'm feeling deeply joyful, that, that mm. there's something, you know, someone more behind this, you know. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I always receive it as a gift. Put it that way. Yeah. 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 Mm. Why Mary? Why is Mary important? Oh, she's one of us. She's part of the family. You know, you could invite her in and have a cup of tea, a cup of tea with her, and be perfectly at home. You know, she's she's. Uh, She's the first believer. She she had to ask her questions, which we know she did, um, as we have to. Um, you know, how come this is happening? I'm a virgin. You know, the way she went. Um, she uh, she's a great. She's, she's a fruitful person, mm. profoundly fruitful. So she's a great model for us in, in in our family lives and in our ministries and our various teaching, priesthood, whatever that her fruit, fruitfulness is terribly important. We, you hardly see her in the Gospel, but wherever she is, she's fruitful. Mm, she is. You know, whether it be at a good party, or whether whether at the cross, mm. nurturing John, or whether at the, at, the, at the Pentecost with the disciples. It doesn't say anything, it just says she's there, but you know, there's, there's, that's where the community's born, that you and I belong to. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You sort of hinted at my next question, which had to do with challenge. Right. Where do you see Mary being most challenged? Oh, gosh, well, I've never been a refugee, but she was. Mm. So, uh, she wasn't exactly seeking asylum, but she was certainly a refugee. She was uh, challenged because she was a young child, really. A teenage girl, from what we can work mm. out, she's expecting a baby. You know, stuff gets written, and scholars do their work, and there's a lot of speculation about what the climate was at the time mm. of the pregnancy. Mm. But I imagine that was a very challenging time. Um, and then there's all the challenges of being a mum when your kid gets lost, and you know, there's all those human things which are just, which are just lovely. Yeah. You know, they're just yeah. so ordinary. You know. Like her kid was lost at the Easter show, except he was lost down at the temple, you know? <laughs> and uh, all that stuff. That's great. Her challenge was, uh, um, and, and a really big challenge, of course, like every mother, was letting her son go. Mm. Having to let him go to the point of his death on the cross. Mm. Mm. The next question, uh, with all these questions, you don't have to answer if you don't want to. Um, what was the hardest moment of your life that required you to serve? That required me to to serve. There've been so many of them. A bit like the joyful moments. Mm. I don't. I, I, I don't have a hardest moment. Um, 
I suppose, you know, you could look at my mum's funeral seven years ago or my youngest brother's funeral yeah. three years ago. Um, I knew, you know, it, was, it was a no-brainer. I was there to do that. You know, mm. it, was, it was not a question. And in fact, doing the funerals wasn't hard. Saying goodbye to my mum and my brother was, mm. you know, and still having to be there for everyone else. Yep. Probably that, you know. Yep. Uh, so moments like that my dad much, much earlier in my life as well. Mm. Um, falling in love and having to wrestle with the beauty of a lovely relationship mm. and mm. discerning where that relationship should go and whether I should mm. remain where I was yep. as a Marist and a priest or whether I should move on. Mm. Um, there, there, were, there were some biddies. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Have these moments made you healthier, wiser, freer, and more autonomous? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why? Uh, well, uh, suffering, sorry, I'm pissed learning, so I reckon. Yeah. Um, you look at the book of Job, which is one of my favourite books in the Old Testament, and he's got, always got his fees in the shit, you know? <laughs> and he's, and he's uh, I love it, because he's, uh, cursed be the day I was born, this is awful, I'm no good, you know, uh, and, the, and then, then he turns to God. Oh, you know, and he starts sucking, sucking up to God. Then he starts sort of reaching out, and he, he, he sort of realizes that his suffering isn't the end of the matter. Mm. And and uh, I think that's the great mystery of suffering. When we're in the middle of it, that's all we can feel or mm. see. You know, we want to run away sometimes. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The fear that it brings. Um, the, the uncertainty about one's future, um, certainly ageing brings its own set of that kind of stuff. I had mm. prostate cancer a couple of years ago, that was a really significant time. Mm. And, uh, and, and it was like going on a retreat. <laughs> not, a, not a very pleasant one, <laughs> accompanied by all the equipment that was needed mm. after the operation. But, uh, but just stepping back from my role, and for some months thinking, will I get my life back? Mm. And, and I have, but more. And you know, I'm more, I'm, I'm, I'm more alive now than I was beforehand. It's mm. like the, the beautiful beatitude: "Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted." And the, the original meaning of that word "comfort" means you're more alive than you were before. Mm. You know? mm. So, so our suffering should enrich us. Mm. It's called resurrection. Mm. Yeah. It's like the whole process. Yeah, yeah, and dying and rising. Has God given you any goodness? What has he give, given you, or something that is good? Oh, all the time, every day. Um, getting out of bed, and everything that follows. Including the battles, and the stresses, and the... It's all good. Mm. Uh, you know, I love it. In Genesis, when God looks at creation and saw that it was good, God saw that it was good. I think there's an encouragement in that story for us to look at life and say, aren't you good? Now, when we're struggling, it's real hard to do, and sometimes we can't do it mm. if we've been deeply wounded or abused or something, you know. So a lot of people can't say, look at the church, for instance, and say that it's good because of the pain that people in the church have caused them. Mm. And uh, that's totally understandable, and maybe they never will be able to. No. Because the pain runs profound for some people. Mm. Uh, having said that, um, please God, they've got other places they can look and see goodness. Mm. You know, and that life can be good. Can be born. Yeah, or, yeah. Mm. Or, or refreshed, you know. So, but, um, yeah. Oh, it's, it's too general a question to answer in a way, but it, it yeah. Mm. I, I ask yeah, it because in our news we see bad news oh, all the time. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Goodness. Oh, yeah. There's, there's, yeah. We forget it sometimes. What about, obviously Jesus is the greatest embodiment of God's goodness, like giving himself. Yeah. Um, how has Jesus been part of your life? He's always been there, uh, since I was a child. Hmm. I, um, he's never left. Um, I've, I've wanted to give him the flick occasionally, you know, when uh, going was tough. But he's... He's, um, he's just woven into the fabric to every breath. Mm. 
but it's not how is he here, it's he just is. So they don't, it's not rocket science. No. It's, a, it's a conscious, it's like when you really love someone, I mean, you're not thinking of them all the time, but if they weren't, if you weren't in daily contact, there'd be something wrong. And if you weren't somehow conscious, oh, I must tell this to her or him, you know? If you, if you weren't conscious that they're, they're part of your daily story, there'd be something, it wouldn't be much of a relationship. Mm. And with Jesus, it's the same. In exchange. And that's why prayer is mm. important. You know, just to, so it becomes a habit as, as simple as breathing. That's why your prayer as you, get, as you go along becomes quieter and less wordy. Mm-hmm. You, don't need, you don't need to be talking all the time, you just be. You just be in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. How do you think Maris have modelled goodness? Maris of their being, each, each one would have done it. Maris' sister or brother or layperson, priest would have done it in each in her or his own way. Um, so I don't know, but, but our Maris thing is really to try and um, have that, the, well, as, as our constitution say, to breathe like Mary, to think like Mary, you know, to just, to, um, to be there supporting God's people, mm. you know. And that's our role, rather than to be running things, mm. but to be supporting. And, uh, to, and that requires a lot of listening, a lot of patience, and and, uh, and, uh, and an ability not to judge too quickly. I mean, we're all prone to that. Yeah. But I think I think uh, the Mara's thing is just to wait and really just don't know what the story of this person is. So wait, mm. you know? Mm. I think that's, that's part of it. So, um, how the Mara's bring goodness into the world. Um, I suppose we're meant to, like Mary, give birth to the Word of God, who is the ultimate good. Uh, mm, thank you. Um, in the Magnificent, Mary says, His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud of heart in their thoughts, and He has brought down the powerful from their throne. So in light of that, mm-hmm. Um, what story in the Bible for you most speaks of conversion, so the changing? Oh, there's stacks of them. You know, you've got Jeremiah getting called and saying, I'm, I'm no good, and he goes, yeah, you are, come on. You know? um, there's Zacchaeus coming down from his tree. There's the woman at the well. Um, there's the leper who turned back and said thanks. There's, there's uh, the, 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 the apostles' slow conversion. Mm. I like that because, you know, we're more Three like years. that. We're more like yeah. that. Um, mm. They weren't. St. Paul's were, evidently was a fairly quick thing, but we don't know, you know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's. Um, th- those, that phrase from the Magnificat is, is radical, and it's about revolution. It was, it was banned in Chile during the. Um, when Allende was president. Mm. The Magnificat was banned as a public prayer. Now, it hasn't been banned here yet, <laughs> so I reckon we've got work to do. Because it really is about taking the order of things, the injustice of the world and, and turning it mm. on its head, you know. And uh, there's still a hell of a lot of injustice, mm. including you know, just the recent further announcement by our Defence Minister about, um, no, our Immigration Minister, around people seeking asylum mm. and so on. Appalling. So the, the Magnificat needs to be sung loud and strong still. But the conversion stories in, in the scriptures are... Uh, are meant to be a template for our own ongoing conversion. Mm. So I look at the part of me that gets high and powerful and needs mm. to be knocked off, knocked down, you know? Mm. So we start studying here before we start looking out there too. Mm. Yeah. That dimension of humility, of being mm. one with mm. others. And mm. Mm. Yeah. Have you ever got it wrong in life? Oh God, all the time, yeah. Lots. Yeah, uh, yeah it's part of being human. Mm. Um, we're all... You know, we're, we're, the Catholic Church teaches that we're basically good, we're created good, and we are sca- we have the propensity to sin, which was what we mean by original sin. Um, it's it's uh, so we're, we're all we're all um, capable of sin, and we all do it sometimes. So I've, I've got it wrong at times, yeah. Hmm. Whether whether because um, again, Richard Raw talks about the great temptations that Jesus faces in the desert of 
power, prestige, and possessions. Mm. You know, they're the, they're the three biggies. And uh, we're, we're all, we can all get, you know, I can't imagine life without my computer, my guitar, my car, mm. my TV, my air conditioning, you know, all that. Mm. And, oh, and your possessions can become so central to who you are, or your prestige. Oh, you're mm. the parish priest, you're, you're the songwriter, you know, you're the... Uh, the different roles. Yeah, so, uh, uh, and, and power, uh, power also. Um, so, so, so they all, so ego is always getting in the way. Mm. You know? Have you been forced to change? Like you've realised, oh, I've oh got I'm this constantly role. changing. I'm, I'm 68. I'm still growing. I'm still trying to get the joke <laughs> and, and work out how to get Mr. Ego off the stage. Mm. And so, at every now and then, Mr. Ego gets on the stage and has a bit of a go, and I go away. And that's Wouldn't why every night at the end of the day, I look at my heart and say, "How do I go today?" And just, just review the day. What do you mean by ego? Oh, when I put myself before everyone else or everything else. So when, when, um, yeah, when, when, um, when the gifts that I, many gifts I've been given to use, uh, uh, subconsciously or unconsciously, and then I, I attribute to myself. Mm. You know. And when, and when um, uh, like the seagulls in Nemo, mm. their favourite word or their only word was mine. <laughs> mine, 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 mine. I mean, when that stuff starts happening, and, it, and it's very, it can be very subtle. Mm. And also it can happen not only individually but in a community. Mm. So when you've got a whole culture doing Botox or doing being obsessed with appearance, cosmetics, when you get a whole culture that is obsessed with self, you can't be a spectator in your own culture. Mm. It's very easy to be sucked into that, you know? So you lose sight. You get, yeah, lose perspective. And so, so it really is important, not only for an individual, but for a community to look at its heart. So how are we going here? Mm. You know? Mm. What do we need to change? What does Jesus say about the poor? Well, first of all, he loved them. And he got in trouble for eating with him. Uh, and he, 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 uh, he talks about the poor in spirit. And again, scholars argue what that meant, means. But there's a, there's, a, there's a dimension of the poor in spirit that, that equates to a certain poverty that says that it is frugal and shares what it has, mm. even though it hasn't got much. Mm. You know? So, so uh, being, being, and he encourages us to that kind of poverty where we, we receive everything as gift. We don't imagine. We, we, we don't have the illusion that we own things, mm. you know? So everything belongs to God. Well, every, well, everything belongs to everyone. Yeah, it all comes from God, but it's meant to be shared. It's not meant to be locked up in a vault or in a storage place up on Victoria Road here, you know? Mm. It's meant to be shared. Mm. So, so, so whatever we have um, belongs. And that, that's why one of the challenges that we being a religious, being a member of a, the Maris, um, everything I have in this room, the guitar I play, the keyboard I play, and my amplifier there on the floor that I'll be using tomorrow, they're, they're all, um, they belong to the Maris Fathers. Mm. Yeah, they're not mine. Mm. Mm. Is, is there a, it's a great freedom in that. Because you, you, you share that, obviously. Yeah, they're tools of trade, um, and they... Uh, I can become very possessive of them, my camera, my room, my whatever, yeah. And so there's a constant challenge then to say, okay, as God said to the rich fool, this very night your life will be required of you, even your life's only on loan, pal, so mm. don't get too attached to it, you know. So do you think there's a problem with being rich? Yeah, there's a certain poverty that being rich when we, uh, if you read my bulletin piece that I've written for this weekend, <laughs> uh, uh, there's a little note in there about it. Um, uh, yeah, there's a certain... Uh, if I am wealthy, I can allow my wealth to be the... This is ego again. I can allow my wealth to be the, my central project. Mm. Yeah, my central project. In terms of parish life, you get people... will come to special sacramental events with their children. And... Uh, but they'll say, oh, we can't come to Mass. They say, we work seven days a week. Someone said that to, me, to my, our, one of the girls in the parish a while back, and she had a great conversation with them about it. Said, 
Their whole life is making Wooden. money. Mm. That's what the rich fool. Mm. You know? You're trapped. Ah, there's a great poverty in that. Mm. And, then, and you live such a stressful life, you know. Mm. That was the point. <laughs> uh, so the poor, the poor have a certain freedom. I was working with a group the other day and I used the story, I remember it years ago after 9-11 when the Americans were still working out who their enemy was and who mm. they were going to bomb next, you know, who was to blame. They decided on Iraq after a while. Um, but there was a bloke, ABC's foreign correspondent had a program and they were in Tajikistan just over the Af mm -hmm. Afghan border mm -hmm. and there was a lovely young Australian journalist and she asked this old bloke outside his mud hut, she said, are you are likely to be invaded by many refugees when if the Americans start bombing around here? What will you do? And they were in the middle of a drought, you can just see it was a desperate country. And he said, oh, he said, we got nothing, but we'll share it. <laughs> it's the most beautiful, you know? Mm. That's mm. that's the poverty of the gospel. Mm. So are you saying the poor are the people who recognise it? Like what? Some, some. Some try to, some spend their whole lives trying to win, win lotto so they can become rich. Mm. Their, their whole focus is getting wealthy. And... and, and the, there's something worthy about wanting to have a better life for yourself and your family. You know, it's perfectly appropriate and apt and good. But, but, but when you spend your whole life um, focused on making more money, you know, on becoming rich for the sake of it, yep. then you're in strife. Yep, yep. You have the same poverty as the rich person. Because yeah. mm. money's at the centre of everything. Today, when, when has God lifted up the poor? Answer that question. Yeah, I don't know. I can't answer that. Okay. What type of relationship did Mary have with God? Oh, you'd have to ask her. You'd take the camera over to her. Like, obviously, a faithful one, a loving one. Um, you know, we can. It's all speculation. In terms of what was in her, but what we do know, she was faithful to God's call and and and, and uh, uh, honoured everything that God had asked of her. So there must have been a great love there to mm. give her whole life over to God's purposes. Mm. She must have had a great, a, a significant understanding of her people's story. How much we don't know, you know, but she must have had some sense of the history and the longing for the Messiah and. I wonder what she thought the Messiah was going to be before mm. she gave birth to her little boy, you know? Mm. Uh, would it be like this? Probably not. You know? mm. um, it's supposed to be powerful and safe a place, you know? So, but her, whether, whether, uh, whether she was... She, I dare say she got upset with God, like we all do. Um, one of the beautiful things the Jewish people gave us are the Psalms. And half the Psalms are whinging. Mm. And Jesus quotes one of them on the cross. He mm. thinks too, you know. Mm. I think that's great. <laughs> you know, makes us at one with them. Mm. The word became flesh. He shared our humanity, you know. So, uh, would fragile? Do you think fragile? Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, good word. Do you think God helps those who help themselves? Is the cliche. All oh, right. Yeah. God helps those who help themselves. Um, God's not, I don't see God as a uh, magician or a puppeteer, in, you know, doing spectacular incursions into human history. And I don't think Jesus was an expression of that either. It was something more profound than that. Um, does God help? Well, we've got the old hymn, Oh God, our help in ages past. Uh, so there we, 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 we believe God is our help. Yeah. Um, Knowing God and loving God and believing in God helps 